So I got this Nintendo DSi a while back from the flea market, and while it's cool and all, I couldn't help but wonder how great it would be if I could charge it with the same cable as my phone and laptop instead of needing to carry a dedicated charging brick just for this console. Sure, it's just one extra cable, but given that it's a portable device meant to be used on the go, every bit of space saving helps, and that's how we ended up here. Now, I'm aware that USB-C mods for the DSi already exist, but most of them involve removing the original charging port and replacing it entirely. This mod, however, will add the USB-C port without removing the original port. The mod we're about to do isn't too bad. There's some plastic cutting and soldering, but otherwise I rate it an intermediate level on the difficulty scale. This guide is specifically for smaller sized Nintendo DSi console, and not for other models like the DS Fat, DS Lite, DSi XL, or the 3DS series. As for equipment, we'll need a size 00 Phillips head screwdriver, a trying pick, a cutting blade, a set of needle files, either super glue or a glue gun, and a soldering setup. A multimeter might be useful for finding out the polarity of certain test points, but I'll show them in this video anyway. Safety wise, we'll need safety glasses and a dusk mask. This is because we'll be filing down plastic and we don't want to breathe in any of the dust. Now for the materials. The two main items we'll need are wires and a USB-C port. The wires I'm using here are 30 gauge, which is really thin, but if you can't find that type, anything between that and 22 gauge should still work. The USB-C port I'm using is usually listed on eBay as a USB-C breakout port. There are multiple types available, and you need to make sure to find one with 5.1k resistors included. The most common types you'll find on eBay are ones without resistors on the CC pins, and while they will let you charge from USB-A to USB-C, you won't be able to charge them from a USB-C to USB-C source. And this is because USB-A will almost always output 5 volts, which is what we need, whereas USB-C can supply multiple voltages and need to be told what voltage we need. The 5.1k resistors on CC1 and CC2 basically tells the host that we need 5 volts, which is why they're important. The grey blob here is just something the manufacturer included for water and dust resistance. Not all ports will have them, so don't be worried if yours doesn't. It's not important. Now that we have everything, it's time to begin. You've probably noticed the sticker on the back of this console here. Don't worry, this is not a natural dev unit. Obviously, those are quite rare and should not be modded. This is just a regular console that the previous owner shell swapped, and I decided to stick a label on. Make sure the console is powered off, then eject the game card as well as the SD card if they are present. Also, remove the stylus so that it doesn't get in the way later. We can now unscrew the battery door and remove the battery. Next, there should be two rubber feet in these positions. They are missing on mine, but on yours you can remove them with a prying stick to reveal these two screws. We can then remove this one short screw and six longer screws. You may notice these two holes that look like they have screws inside them, but those are actually potentiometers used to calibrate the two screens, so make sure you don't touch them. If you accidentally insert a screwdriver in there, there's a risk of breaking the potentiometers off the ribbon cable, and this can cause the screens to stop working properly. With the screws out of the way, we can use a prying stick to work our way around the outside of the lower casing. We can't completely separate these two halves just yet because there's still a ribbon cable connecting them together. So make sure to pop the plug off the socket before proceeding. Now, something important to bear in mind is that this thin section of plastic here is very fragile and can easily break if you handle it too roughly. So whenever you're holding the lower casing, make sure to only grip it by the edges and avoid putting pressure on this area here. For now, we can put the upper half aside and work on the lower casing. We'll need to remove everything from the lower casing, and we can start with these eight screws. Next, we can take out these two covers for the triggers.
With the covers removed, we can then take out the triggers themselves. These consist of a plastic button, a spring, and a retention rod. Now, the springs on these tend to go flying quite easily, so make sure to keep track of them and don't lose them. The roping cable is attached to the back casing by adhesive, and so we can use some alcohol to loosen the glue. With the glue loosened, we can finally remove the SD card reader assembly and the rest of the electronics from the back casing. There are still a few final things we need to remove from the back casing, namely these two metal nuts and this SD card slot cover. Now that we have just the bare lower casing, we can work on adding the cutout for the new charging port. We will be repurposing the lanyard slot by cutting out the inner plastic in between these two holes and then expanding it so that we can fit the USB-C receptacle. With the cutting blade, we can cut the walls of the inner lanyard slot and slowly remove the material piece by piece. We'll need to make sure there are no raised pieces of plastic in the way, and any remaining material can be removed with a blade or a file. A Dremel might help here. We will also need to remove this small section of plastic on the SD card reader cover, and this can be done with a cutting blade and file. Next, we will work on expanding the lanyard slot. With a circular needle file, we will slowly file away the material in between the two holes until they are joined. Ideally, you should be using a file that has a diameter of 3.1mm, as that's about the same height as the shroud of the USB-C port. The filing process can take quite a while to do, so take your time and don't rush. Eventually, you'll be able to join the two holes with the file. However, at this point, the hole might not be the right size or shape to fit the USB-C port. In which case, you can smooth out the longer edges and heighten the gap using a flat edge file, while also elongating the gap using a rounded edge file. Throughout this process, make sure to constantly test the fit of the USB port. Initially, it might be easier to test from the outside, but once the hole is the right shape and size, we can then start fitting internally. Eventually, you'll reach a point where the USB-C port can fit snugly within the slot. During the testing process, also make sure to test the fit with the SD card reader. One of the most common issues is the corner of this board here coming into contact with the corner of the SD card reader. And if that happens, you'll need to adjust the fit by either using a file to remove more material from the casing or removing some material from the board itself. 
Before we can fix the USB-C board in place, we'll need to solder wires to the positive and negative terminals. Here, they are marked V for positive and G for negative. Normally, they are just marked plus and minus. As for the wires, I normally cut 20cm and then trim them down later. We'll want to position them so that the port is facing forwards and the wires are going off towards the left. With the wires attached, we can do a partial reassembly to test the fit. First, we put the USB-C board in its place. Then, we slide the SD card port cover in and make sure the bumps are aligned with the casing. And finally, we can put the metalwork cover on top. We can now reinstall the SD card reader and ribbon cable along with the battery slot and triggers. Make sure to also put the steel nuts in place under the battery slot. If everything fits, then that's good news and we can proceed. But if anything doesn't go together properly, then you'll need to go back and readjust the fit. Usually that just means filing down more material and retesting. During reassembly, make sure that the ribbon cable is arranged so that the plug side is on top of the sponge side and not the other way around. Other than that, we can start screwing the cover plate back into place. To hold the USB-C board in place, we can use a small amount of hot glue. Don't go too crazy and just put a little bit here and here so that it can go underneath the board. Make sure there's just enough to secure the board, but not so much that it overflows. The bottom half of the casing is almost done. We just need to route the cables up, around the game card reader slot, and then back down to this spot here, which is where the original charging port is located. We can use electrical tape to hold them in place. Before we solder the cables to the charging port, make sure there's enough slack. I usually give it a few centimeters before trimming. Now, we just solder the red wire to the positive and the black wire to the negative pins. Make sure you get the polarity correct, as connecting them in reverse can damage the console. In this case, the pin on the left is the negative and the pin on the right is the positive. Now we can give it a quick test. When we plug in the USB-C cable, we can see that the charging light is now flashing. And it's not drawing any power because there's no battery connected, but this is a good sign that it's working. We can start putting everything back together now. Before we close everything up, we just want to take one last look and make sure the wires are routed in the correct direction. We want to make sure that it loops down here and back up here, and it's not in any way of the screw holes or the cartridge reader. With the ribbon cable, it can be a bit tricky to just plug it in straight away like this, so what I find to make it easier is that I can lift it up slightly, which gives us a little more room to work with. With the ribbon cable plugged in, we can then realign the back case and 
snap it into place. With the casing snapped back together, we can now put the remaining screws back in. Once again, make sure to avoid inserting the screwdriver into these two holes, as these are not screws. Finally, we can put the battery, SD card and stylus back in to complete the mod. And there you have it. We've taken a Nintendo DSi console and added a modern connector so we can charge it with regular phone charges instead of having to carry out an extra brick. The DSi only draws a small amount of power, and that's because it was never designed to support fast charging like most modern phones do, but it's modern enough to power up the system in a short amount of time. As for gaming on a console itself, it still holds up pretty well even though it's an older system. With the custom firmware installed, I can dump the contents of my game cartridges and play the games directly off the SD card which saves me having to carry around a stack of game cards. I hope you've enjoyed this modding guide, and I'll see you in the next one.